working on your dream and doing your life work, you must be patient, persistent, and positive no matter what. I called John H. Johnson for two and a half years to get in that magazine. The first time I called him, he wouldn't talk to me. Then I was persistent, trying to find out who knew him that could invite me there to meet him or an opportunity to speak so that he could hear me. And I met a guy who worked for him. And I said, hey, I'd like to speak for you guys free. I just want to know, will he be in the audience? They said, yes, good. I spoke and I tried to tear the microphone up. <laughs> and he said after I finished, hey, young man, you're quite impressive. I'm going to have my staff do an article on you. I said, thank you, Mr. Johnson. And I sent him information on me, Federal Express. And it didn't happen. Waited for a month and it didn't happen. Waited for two months. It didn't happen. I stopped calling every month. Hello, how are you, man? Speak to Mr. Johnson. I'm sorry he's not available. Tell him Les Brown calling. I just want to say thank you very much for the article when he puts it in. I kept on doing it, kept on calling, kept on calling, sending new articles, sending new information on me, kept on upgrading the information on me, sending him thank you letters. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I was always positive. I could have gotten negative saying, where did you lie to me? Why are you going to tell me you're going to put me in the magazine and you didn't do it? I could have got an attitude, be positive no matter what, because when you are negative, ladies and gentlemen, you're sending out negative energy and you're blocking your good. So don't send out any negative energy. Don't take it personal. I didn't care what he thought of me or the staff that I was a nuisance to them. They get paid to deal with people like me. I wanted to be in that magazine. They got a subscription of 1.7 million people. Ask me, do I care what they think about me? <laughs> Any sensible, reasonable, intelligent person know if somebody doesn't call you back after two and a half years, they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Ask me, do I care about that? <laughs> Results don't lie, I'm in the magazine. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> See, a lot of people have an idea or a dream and they give up on it. No, no, don't do that. Work your dream until it get hot. See. Most things don't happen as soon as we think they should happen. The messenger of misery might drop in on you and say hello. <laughs> Murphy's Law might come by and thump you on the head. <laughs> Any number of things can happen to interrupt your flow. It's okay. Don't take it personal. Just acknowledge what's going on. It's called life and keep on working on your dream. Continue to keep on knocking, keep on knocking because this is your life. This is what you love. This is your passion. Step back. Don't judge it. If you judge it, judge not yet unless ye be judged. Why? Because when you judge it, you invest emotion in it. And that mo emotion could be anger. And guess what? That hurts you. That doesn't hurt anybody else. One doctor said, the man who angers me killeth me. And then he allowed someone to egg him into an argument on the floor of the National Medical Convention and suffered a massive heart attack. When you're in a state of anger, you have so much acid in your blood, if they withdrew some blood from you and insert it into a pig, it would die from the acid. So what do you want to take yourself out early for by internalizing things? Shakespeare said, nothing is neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. So judge not according to appearances, but write judgment and feel that everything is going to work out for you because you're patient, you're persistent, and you're going to be positive no matter what. Don't allow other things or people or circumstances to determine what your reaction is going to be. I was out to dinner with some people and we had a waitress that was quite discourteous and rude. And the people around me took a, an attitude about it. I learned how to observe life. I think that in order to overcome life, you've got to learn how to observe it. Just stand back and watch what's going on and choose not to buy into it. I said, excuse me, ma'am. I said, do you know what TIP stands for? She said, no. I said, TIP stands for to ensure promptness. We've been sitting here a long time. I want to give you $5 up front to ensure a prompt meal. Would you assist me? She gave me the biggest smile and said, oh, of course I will. <laughs> and I said, by the way, I'm not with these people. I'm going to be sitting at another table. Please put my meal over there. Serve them by themselves. See, I don't want to make anybody angry who goes behind closed doors to prepare my food. I got my food. If I told them, I said, if I were you, I would eat that. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the manager? I want to see him. She said, I'll get him just a minute. I know what she did to their food. <laughs> oh, no. I said, eat that at your own risk. I don't even want y'all driving me home. I'll get your cab. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know when that's going to take effect on you. So don't allow people to determine how you are going to respond to them 
or circumstances. Learn to look at it. A friend of mine, Tom Perkins, handsome, articulate man in his mid-50s. He had a tremendous business. And at the height of his success, someone was killed in his business. He was sued and lost $750,000. Lost his business, lost his family, lost his home, everything. He was devastated, ladies and gentlemen. He started living in his car. He would wash up in a McDonald's across from Howard University on Georgia Avenue in Washington, D.C. He said, Les, I was so depressed. He said, I had everything and then one day I lost it all. He said, I didn't want to live anymore. He got some sleeping pills and he took over 35 sleeping pills and he laid down, folded his hands across his chest and he said he went to sleep to die. Two days later, much to his amazement, he woke up. He couldn't even get that right. I said, what happened then, Tom? He said an incredible thing happened. He said he was laying there for a moment. He said, and a voice said to him inside his mind, it wasn't your life to take. That was one thing. He said, since that day, when I get any major challenges, I don't take it on myself personally. I feel that I've got somebody with me. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, hey, I said, God, you got to handle this for me. This is too much for me. He said, I don't sweat the challenges of life. Repeat out to me, please. Don't sweat the small stuff because it's all small stuff. <laughs> See, whatever you worried about, if someone called, call you right now and say, listen, you got two days to live. I'm telling you, you won't be worried about your bills, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you won't be worried about whether or not somebody loves you or cheating on you <laughs> because you're about to check out. <laughs> okay. So put things in perspective. Here's something else Tommy said that I think is important. He said that the voice also said to him, if you change your ways, I'll give you far more than you ever lost. Look at your life right now. If you want to keep on getting what you're getting, keep on doing what you're doing. You've got to be willing to change your ways. Your life is working. If you don't like what you have produced, you are director, you are the star, you wrote this script. You produced this, whatever it is. If it's a hit, you produced it. If it's a flop, you produced it. Take ownership of it and decide to go back to the drawing board and rewrite the script that you are the star of. You have the power to do that. On this day, you can declare that I'm going to change. As you look back on your life, you can decide that I don't like what I've produced here and I want higher ground. I want to begin to experience more love. I want to have more adventure in my life. I want something that gives my life a sense of meaning. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been selected to head up a program called Project Life in Chicago, training thousands of kids. and. I had the experience, This we had our second session this past Monday, and to see these young people when they came in, and to see the young people and the parents and the community volunteers when they went out, one young man from the Cabrini Green Housing Projects who didn't want to be there, who came up and said, I want you to know I'm so glad to be here. And he said, I'll never be the same again. He said, thank you, Mr. Brown. He said, I just got to go now, but thank you, sir. I'll never be the same again. To see a letter I got from a young man who was in the Cook County Jail where I work on Monday morning. And this young man will not be out of jail for at least 50 years. At least 50 years. They gave him 100 years. This guy has shot at least 60 people that we know of and killed 10 at least. And this letter he wrote, he said, since listening to your tapes, he said, I have not changed, but I feel a different person in me. Over 70% of these young men are in there for murder. We wanted to have a two-prone attack where we would train people on the outside 
and train those that are in the jails because I believe if you cage them like animals and treat them like animals and they're out on the streets every 22 months, they're going to get out and act like animals and go back in like animals. So we said, let's take an approach. This gives me my life. This Now this might be insane. But I felt so good, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, if we can accept the possibility of that this is the decade of consciousness. That's what I believe that this is. The decade of consciousness, if you please. A time where we can begin to create in folks' minds the idea, the possibility that we can create a more humane society, the possibility that we can create more love, communication, and understanding in relationships, the possibility that we can create a drug-free America, the possibility that we can create the kind of respect for diversity and difference in our multicultural society, the possibility that we can begin to develop the mindset to bring out the best in people, to encourage them to achieve their greatness and support them in their dreams, that if we can, in this decade of consciousness, to begin to see and envision that happening and that we all can play a role that we were born for such a time as this that we showed up for this that we survived one out of nine million sperms and we have been chosen for this great work what an exciting time to be alive here's something else to recognize wherever you are on the ladder of life and i was reading in dr norman vincent peale's latest book called the power of positive living which i think is his greatest work and he has something in there, a section called Comeback Power. Wherever you are in life, ladies and gentlemen, you've got comeback power. I don't care how low you are. I don't care what you have done. I don't care what you have experienced. I don't care how devastated your life might appear to be. The shambles it might be in. There's a power in you that can enable you to be stronger and better than anything that's out here. One man who came to the training, he was not a kid. And I knew he had a drinking problem and he was looking at me and I can smell alcohol on him. I said, excuse me, come here, come here, come here. He said, what is it? I said, let me tell you something. I want you to know you've got something in you that's stronger than that poison you're putting in your body. Do you understand me? And he was looking, he was backing up, he said, he said, uh, uh, no, no. He said, I, I, I don't know, man. I said, it is. I said, that's why you're here. Something drew you here. And that which caused you to come, you said you want some help. And you need to be around some people that can help you get in touch with your power because you know that your life deserves this. See, I think that the reason that we abuse ourselves with drugs and alcohol is that we're trying to numb something in us that's, that's aching us, that's, that's urging us, that's nagging us to do something bigger and better. It can't be because it tastes so good. It can't be because crack feels so good. Or cocaine is not that simple. That when we are deluding ourselves or polluting our minds, it numbs us where we don't have to face reality. Because we don't know what we've got going for us. See, once you discover who you are, the truth of knowing who you are will set you free from ever wanting alcohol, from ever wanting any kind of drug that's going to destroy who you are. Once you begin to know who you are, it will set you free from believing, I can't see myself doing any better. Once you discover this power, this the perfect essence of who you are that's in all of us, that's permeating our being, that enable us to be the directors of our lives, that you truly can live a healthy, happy, prosperous life and that you can make it in what are called the worst of times. I think it was Robert Shuley said, tough times never last, but tough people do. And you are tough. You're made of some special stuff. There was nobody here before you. You brought something here that was not here before you showed up. Guess what? Nobody's going to do your work for you. Nobody's going to write your book for you. Nobody's going to open your boutique. That has been given to you to do. Nobody can help those people you want to help. They will only respond to your voice. You were sent here to speak a word that will wake them up. As sure as the word was spoken 2,000 years ago, Lazarus, come forth! You will speak that word and ignite and bring to life many who have entombed themselves in fear and mediocrity and a limited vision and low self-esteem. 
So as you leave, I hope that you challenge yourself to begin to look within, knowing that you have comeback power, knowing that you came and brought something here that was not here before you came. And whatever that dream is, whatever that great work is, don't let anybody take it from you. Fight for it. 